Squeeze every moment out of summer with a mango dragon fruit Starbucks refreshers beverage. It's a combo of sweet mango and bold dragon fruit flavors for a vibrant, refreshing way to cool down on hot days. Your happy is here at Starbucks. Order ahead on the app. Your favorite band's about to play a sold out show, and you definitely got tickets and drinks. Now hurry and make it back to your spot. Pass this person and that person about 20 more. Ooh, watch out for feet. Hey. Just keep going. A little further. Oh, there's your friend. Over here. Right where you want to be. Close enough to see the set list. And they're definitely playing your song. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Storyworthy Media. The best in story-driven content. This is Iva Davis, and you're listening to Story Worthy. Welcome to Story Worthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Wondery Sunset Studio in West Hollywood, California. Now, I am so glad you guys tuned in today. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show or a new listener, welcome to Story Worthy. Now, today's story is brought to us from author Ivor Davis, and it's titled, I Was George Harrison's Ghostwriter. Boy, you don't get more specific than that, right? I mean, you don't hear that story every day. And who is not a Beatles fan among us? Am I right? Now, recently, did I tell you this, Sergio? I read my daughter a book about the Beatles. And it's just, it's like surreal explaining to her this band. I mean, the book was really good. Don't get me wrong. It like broke it down to who the guys were individually, like their beginnings. It talked about how much they played, you know, like the 10,000 plus hours they put in before they ever hit it big. And then, you know, they talk about all their hits, of course. So we read the book and then we listened to the Beatles albums at the same time. See what I mean? It's all very fitting. I'm such a good mom. It's not even funny, Sergio. I'm such a good mom. But listen, Ivor Davis, he's on the show today, and he has an incredible story. Ivor Davis was on tour with the Beatles, and he had unrestricted access to these guys. I mean, from their hotel suites to concert arenas to their private jet, he played all-night games of Monopoly with John Lennon. I mean, Ivor was there. Okay, before we get to his story, I did want to remind you guys to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at StoryWorthy. And why not head over to storyworthypodcast.com before you shop on Amazon? I know I tell you to do this all the time, but I tell you for a reason, because it's simple and it works and I'm worth it. That's what I'm saying. All right, let's get right to Ivor's story. Now, Ivor Davis, like I said, he is a reporter and he's an author whose award-winning book, The Beatles and Me on Tour, is available everywhere. And you guys, Ivor Davis is the real deal, okay? I mean, there have been hundreds and hundreds of books written about the Beatles, but very few have been written from anybody who was actually there, you know, who was actually with them. And this is the first chronicle of that tour told by somebody who was on the inside, Ivor Davis. You can find Ivor over at his website, IvorDavisBeatles.com, and on Twitter, at IvorDavisBeatles. Without further ado, guys, Ivor Davis. So here's my story about being George's ghostwriter. I'll keep it down to two hours, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, Now, George had contracted with my newspaper to provide a weekly column, which it announced, the newspaper announced, with a giant breathless headline, A Beetle Writes for the Daily Express. Now, one of my jobs was to make sure that his column would be lively and entertaining, and I was supposed to especially try to capture his voice. It was my first try as a ghostwriter, and frankly, I failed miserably. Now, the idea of putting George on their payroll for the Daily Express was the brainchild of Derek Taylor. Now, Derek, as most of you out there know, was the press agent for the Beatles and the personal assistant to Brian Epstein. Well, Derek said that Brian thought it would be good for George. It would give George kind of an extra interest. And now John and Paul have their songwriting, and Ringo is rather new, said Brian Epstein, the manager. Now, Harrison, a 21-year-old, was the youngest and least communicative 
of the Beatles. Now, my job was to get to know him and worm my way into his skull. Because as conventional wisdom went, his pontifications were expected to be of the utmost importance to pop music. But unlike Paul or John, George wasn't a hell fellow well met. In fact, as I first found him, uh, he was rather grumpy and he did not take well to strangers, which along with his deadpan sense of humour may have explained why he was tagged the quiet beetle. One day, my photo editor in London, after surveying a set of photos of George in America, observed, his face is so frozen. Is he having a stroke or something? Now, Derek, who was the first ghostwriter for George's column before it was turned over to me, considered George his favourite Beatle, and he introduced George and I on the first day of the tour in San Francisco, just a matter of hours before, before their first concert. It was not a particularly impressive encounter. George showed little interest in bonding with me, his new ghost, and I quickly realised I might have to exert some gentle pressure on him if I was to squeeze his inner musings for which he was being handsomely paid. Now, the column, the ghost column, George's column, was to be delivered every Thursday at noon Greenwich Mean Time. And I naively imagined that the, as the deadline approached, the highly compensated Harrison would come knocking on my door for an intimate tater tate spewing forth astute opinions, witty asides and observations. I hadn't reckoned on rocker meantime. The fact that after the insanity of every show, the band would head back to the hotel, order room service, steak, burgers, egg and chips, that's fries. They would down Coke some whiskey, go to bed around four in the morning and sleep until mid-afternoon to prepare for the next concert or press conference or trip to the airport. Now, with Greenwich Mean Time anywhere between four to eight hours ahead of us, depending on where we were in the United States, it made my deadline virtually impossible to keep. What's more, in the midst of all the frenzy, Harrison didn't have much to say for himself. So I quickly made an executive decision. I would concoct my own version of what had happened on the tour for the first couple of columns. And indeed, those first stories that I wrote were totally fabricated. I didn't even bother to run them past George, fearful that he would hate them, grab them up, tear them up, never to be seen again. So while each day I would file hard news reports and personal observations, the tour went on and I would churn out embarrassingly trite claptrap in George's name. It's simply fab in Frisco, was the forgettable fan mag headline that the editor in London put on George's first column, which carried the byline by George Harrison, one of the Beatles, as if he might be mistaken for George Harrison, the Doc Walker from Long Beach or someone like that. And so it went, my mighty pen in George's name grinding out such immortal lines as the reception for the Beatles fans put on for us in San Francisco was simply fab. Well, now, or this one, which I also wrote, or they wrote, even the cops went wild, 18,000 people at Cal Palace, that's by far the biggest audience that has seen us. It was one of the most thrilling experiences of our lives and one of the most painful. I lost count of the times that jelly beans were showered on us from four sides of the gigantic arena. And this is George supposedly talking. I got hit on the back of the neck, on the face, on the nose, on both hands and on my guitar. Well, it continued along in that rather drab way with another column delivering such meaningless morsels as tomorrow we'll be in Las Vegas. And of course, we've all got a system to break the bank in the gambling saloons. Something had to change between us, and indeed, inevitably, there was a showdown September the 5th after a concert at Chicago. We were cruising at 25,000 feet in the electric jet, heading to Detroit, when George came charging down the aisle and stopped at my seat. Without even a civil hello, he said, I'm told my column is boring, a load of old shite. 
Well, I couldn't argue the point, but stung by his reprimand, I shot back, well, it might be helpful if you bothered to get up in the morning and tell me what was on your mind. He looked a little chastened by my blunt answer. He turned and headed back to his seat. And then things improved. I got together with George on a few trips. He loosened up and the column improved. And in fact, we became quite friendly talking about other things. So my ghostwriting adventures with George started badly and ended up much better. Okay, didn't I tell you that was a great story? Am I right? Do you want to go put the Beatles on Spotify? Is that what you want to do? Go ahead. I'll wait. Go to your Pandora. Do what you do. Hopefully you already own the music. By the way, did I mention this? Ivor Davis was also there when Elvis met the Beatles. It was August 27th, 1965. Elvis and the Beatles got together. How about that? He was also there when Bob Dylan got stoned with the Beatles. This guy, Ivor Davis, he is, he's got stories. Okay, you guys, I got to wrap it up right now. I want to thank our storyteller one more time, Ivor Davis. Like I said, you can find Ivor on Twitter at Ivor Davis Beatles. And why not tweet him and let him know how much you loved his story? He would love that. And I would love that because then you can follow me as well at Storyworthy. And remember to check out storyworthypodcast.com and join my mailing list. And join us next week on Story Worthy for a story by the incredibly talented actress, author, producer, and creator, Iris Spar, talking about the most traumatic whitewater rafting story I have ever heard. Fico suddenly grabs my head and shoves it into the base of the raft a nanosecond before a protruding boulder would have sliced it right off. Fuck, fuck, fuckity fuck. You guys, it is truly an unbelievable story. Don't miss Iris Spar next week on Story Worthy. Okay, I want to thank everybody over here at Wondery today, including our sound engineer, Sergio Enriquez. And on behalf of our storyteller, one more time, Ivor Davis. My name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. This summer, paradise is wherever you are with the new Pineapple Passion Fruit Starbucks Refreshers Beverage. With tropical pineapple and passion fruit flavors, it's bright and refreshing, like sunshine in a cup. Your happy is here at Starbucks. Order ahead on the app. What's that place you've always wanted to try? Well, you're there. Sharing plates with... Just one bite. Or on second thought, maybe not sharing. It's that good. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it.